Hi everyone and welcome to this video on the principles of endocrine physiology. In this video we're going to cover a few things. Firstly we'll get a definition of what endocrine means. We'll look at the three fundamentals that are associated with endocrine tissue. We'll look at the different ways that endocrine cells or tissue secretes their hormone. Then move into the hormone itself. So we'll look at the three main categories or at least chemical categories of hormones and the receptors that they bind to. And then finally, we'll see how does the body regulate secretion of hormones within the body. So let's start with the definition. What does endocrine mean? Well, endo means within and crine means to separate or to secrete. So basically, whenever you hear endocrine, it's referring to cells or tissue that secretes a substance that then communicates to the body. So we've already come across nerves as a communication system. So these communication networks rely on electricity. So a nerve will send an action potential down, then release a neurotransmitter that can act on a target organ, let's say the heart. So this nerve releases noradrenaline into the synapse, binds to the receptor and then tells the heart to speed up and be more powerful. But the endocrine system can also do a communication to the heart and many other parts of the body. So a similar example would be the adrenal gland, particularly the adrenal medulla, releases a hormone, in this case noradrenaline, and it goes into a blood vessel. Now we know blood vessels go everywhere in the body, so it's not going to be very localized. But it will travel to the heart because blood will go to the heart. And this neurotransmitter, again, noradrenaline, can bind to the receptor and do the same action. So it's also communicating to the heart, just like we saw with nerves. But the difference here is with a nerve or nerves, it's very localized. It's very fast acting because electricity is faster than blood. And it's really quick on and quick off. Whereas with the endocrine communication system, because we put it into the blood, it takes a lot longer for it to start to work. Therefore, it takes longer to turn off. And it's not very well localized because it goes into the blood. It goes everywhere. So you can imagine that you're going to have more systemic or whole body effects when we use the endocrine system. So that's the definition. Now let's move to the three fundamentals that are associated with endocrine physiology. All right, the first we need, number one, is we need endocrine tissues or cells. Okay, so here's an example here. Here's a endocrine cell that is releasing a substance. Okay, and that's gonna be number two. It needs to have a hormone. And a hormone is just a chemical messenger. Okay, so that we've got the first being the endocrine or the cell or the tissue that's releasing number two, the hormone. And then number three, we need to have the target tissue. The target tissue generally will have receptors on it, which we'll cover when we get to receptors, but they will respond to the hormone. So here is the classic one, two, three. Here one being the cell that releases the hormone, two is the hormone, and then going to three, the target tissue. So that's the fundamental or the principles of what we need to make it endocrine in nature. Now this is where it gets a little bit tricky. When we look at endocrine, we can break it into kind of three, again, three categories. We can have endocrine glands. So these would be, let me just add to this, we can have endocrine glands. So this is tissue that only its whole job is to secrete hormones. Come across here to this picture. Some examples of this would be the pituitary gland. This glandular tissue, all it does is just secrete hormones. That's all it does. Same with the thyroid, same with the parathyroid, same with the adrenal gland. But we also have endocrine tissue. So what this means is we have tissue in the body that will release hormones, but it does other things as well. So the hypothalamus, it does release hormones, so it plays an important role in the endocrine system, but it does other jobs in the body, not just endocrine. So it does other things, but it can also do hormones. Same with the pancreas. The pancreas mostly is an exocrine organ, which means it releases um, digestive enzymes into the duodenum for digestion. But some of it is endocrine in nature, like insulin and glucagon, to help regulate blood sugar levels. And same with the gonads, whether it's the ovaries or the testes, 
Their primary function is to make eggs or sperm, but they can also produce uh, hormones like testosterone and estrogen. And then finally, so that's also endocrine. So endocrine glands, endocrine tissue. But then we just have normal tissue or cells. So they're not endocrine at all, but they can perform some endocrine functions. So an example here could be the heart. We know the heart is primarily just a pump, but it can secrete one hormone called ANP, atrial natural peptide, which is, helps regulate salt balance or pressure. Also the kidneys, we know its primary function is to filter blood, but it can release, say, renin, which is important for blood pressure control and fluid balance control. And even fat, we know fat is primarily just to store energy, but it can also release hormones, which is important for communication. So there's the distinction between the three glands. Primarily, all it does is secrete hormones. An example is pituitary gland, tissue, endocrine tissue, where it will secrete uh, hormones regularly, but it's not necessarily its primary function, such as the pancreas, and then tissue or cells that do other things mostly, but can to some degree release some hormones. So that's the three fundamentals done. Now we move to the types of secretion of these endocrine tissue. So there's three main, main types here, and I'll just rub this out so we don't get it confused. Okay, so the first one is this one here, so I'll put one here, and it is the true endocrine secretion. So the true endocrine secretion is the endocrine cell releases a hormone into blood, it goes into the blood, which means it can go everywhere in the body and then act on the target organ. That is a classic endocrine secretion. Number two, which is this one here, is paracrine. Para kind of means parallel to or nearby. So the cell here, so the endocrine tissue secreting the hormone, instead of going into the blood, it goes into the extracellular fluid, which then goes in the neighborhood. It doesn't go into the whole body and the whole blood. It just goes into the neighborhood. So acts on its neighbors. An example here would be mast cells. We have mast cells in our skin. When they get annoyed by, let's say, a infectious agent comes in like a particular bacteria or a virus or something like that, or maybe a mechanical injury or a change in temperature, these release chemicals like histamines. Histamines then goes to its neighbor. It could act on an endothelial cell. Endothelial cells can retract, causing blood vessels to become more leaky or become more dilated. And this is classic inflammation. That is a paracrine effect. And number three, we have autocrine. Autocrine, which means to act on itself. So here, let's say this is a T cell in the immune system. It has been kind of selected for by an antigen. It then binds to a B cell and it tells the B cell via chemicals to the B cell, hey, B cell, I've got an important job for you. I want you to produce antibodies against this antigen. Okay, so the B cell says, yes, I'll do that. But in doing so, the T cell communicates back to its own self and says to its own self, hey, I'm important here. We need to make more of me. So that autocrine secretion on self helps to tell its own self to clone, copy itself, make more of itself to help fight this particular type of infection. So that's the three types of secretions that we see in the body. Next, we go to hormones and their receptors. So another three, the three types of hormones, at least chemically categorized. The first one are steroids. So the steroid hormones are made from cholesterol or fat. So these in the body, if we go across to here, are located in the adrenal cortex. So this would be aldosterone, cortisol, and the androgens. Also in the gonads, we have estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. These are all steroid-based hormones. They are hydrophobic, meaning they, are, they don't like water. They prefer fat, so they're fat-based. And what they do, Actually, I'll pause that and I'll come to the receptor in a second. Number two, we have amino acids. So amino acids are just building blocks of proteins, but they're just a single one. An example would be derived from tyrosine as an amino acid, and that can be made into some of the catecholamines. So the catecholamines in the adrenal medulla, which we saw up here, would be noradrenaline or adrenaline. 
or even the thyroid hormone T3, T4 uh, amino acid driven uh, neuro uh, hormones, should I say. And then finally, we have peptides. Peptides are the most common, and these are amino acids stacked onto each other. So that could be three to 200 amino acids in length. These are the most common, and examples could be the ones that are secreted from the pituitary gland, let's say like uh, adrenal corticotrophin um, hormone, or we could say insulin or glucagon as an example. Now, based on their characteristics is how that they'll act on the cell. So this is just an example of a target cell here, and the blue denotes the receptor. So with steroids, they are hydrophobic, they are, or they are lipophilic, which means they like fat. Now we know that the membrane is made of fat, so these can actually go straight through the membrane. So an example, aldosterone released from the adrenal cortex is cholesterol based. When it comes to the receptor or the target cell, should I say, because it's fat soluble, it can just go through the membrane and bind to the receptor in the cytosol, in the cytoplasm. Now that then as a complex goes into the nucleus and generally the steroids will change gene expression or the way that the DNA is expressed. Now in this case, what it would do to the DNA is to say to the DNA, hey, I want you to make more pumps. And by putting pumps, now this cell, target cell would be located in the kidney, put in more pumps, therefore absorbs more salt, therefore more water and aldosterone is all about that, retaining water and salt for fluid balance. So that's how steroids would work. Amino acids and peptides, because they are water soluble, they can't get through the membrane and they are polar, they can't get through the membrane, that they, therefore they need receptors on the outside of the cell. An example would be a G protein receptor. Okay, so an example would be oxytocin. Oxytocin binds to a receptor which is coupled to a G protein that then increases processes in the body such as cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP then increases calcium. What calcium then does is cause contraction. So oxytocin acts in the target cell of the uterus and the breast to contract those areas to help expel milk, let's say expel milk or let down milk to help for breastfeeding or for childbirth to deliver the baby. So that's a G protein. An enzyme driven one, would be an example would be insulin. Insulin binds to an enzyme receptor, okay, like a tyrosine kinase receptor, activates a whole host of enzymes in the cell, which then causes, let's say, phosphorylation and changes, uh, let's say there's a bundle of glucose transporters that are all bundled up in the cell. And by that enzymatic action, it causes the glucose transporters to go on the outside of the cell. So this could happen in the muscle cells or fat cells. And by the insulin binding to it, it brings more glucose transporters. Therefore, glucose can enter the cell, blood sugars drop. Okay, so that's an example of the receptors. One other one is a ligand ion gated receptor. So where the, recept the hormone binds, it opens an ion channel. Therefore, ions can go into the cell. So these are the classic hormones, three types of hormones, steroid, amino acid, peptides and the receptors are either going to be in the cell for steroid based ones or on the outside of the cell for the amino acid peptide ones. And then finally we're left with how are hormones in the body? How do we regulate this? Again, we have three. So there's a lot of threes today in the endocrine system. So how do we regulate on secretion? Well, we can regulate by hormone, hormone levels. We can regulate by humoral, I'll get to that in a second, and we can regulate by neural. Let's start with hormones. So basically, just the level of the hormone in the body will decide on how the release is impacted. So, if we are, if the thyroid gland is releasing T3 and T4 as hormones, we do have higher up in the pituitary gland we have a hormone that stimulates the thyroid to tell it to release that. So we have thyroid stimulating hormone, but we also have a hormone coming from the hypothalamus called thyroid releasing hormone. So the, basically the way this work is, the hypothalamus releases a hormone called thyroid releasing hormone, which goes to the anterior pituitary to say release 
thyroid stimulating hormone, which then goes into the blood to the thyroid gland, which then releases T3, T4. As this increases, it goes up and tells this, you need to increase, you need to increase. So actually the low level of a hormone increases this secretion and this secretion. But as it reverses, so as this increases, T3 and T4 in the body, it goes back and turns this one off and turns this one off. So the hormone level, whether it's up or down, will tell the other areas whether they need to secrete more or secrete less. Another form is humoral, which just basically means in fluid, so in the body fluid. So this could be ions or this could be nutrients. So like glucose, and that would be insulin, or ions could be calcium. So if calcium levels are low, so if, let's say we have low calcium levels in the, in the body, in the parathyroid gland, behind the thyroid, we have glandular tissue which picks up the low calcium. It releases PTH, parathyroid hormone, which goes into the body and it, somehow it needs to increase the calcium. So that would go to the bone and tell the bone to release more calcium. It would go to the gastrointestinal tract, tell the gastrointestinal tract to absorb more calcium and also go to the kidney and say, stop secreting calcium. And then once the calcium starts to go back up, it goes back here and turns it off. And then finally, we have neural, which is basically direct nerval stimulation to the hormone area. So if we have the adrenal medulla, which is in here, which we saw that releases no adrenaline, we have nerves that go directly to that, stimulates it and tells it to release its hormone into the blood. When that action potential turns off, then that turns off. Okay, so that goes to the last part is, well, we've seen that hormones, humoral or things in fluid and nerves do this stimulus, but what's the way it does it? And there's two main ways. There is negative feedback and positive feedback. So an example of a negative feedback, so this is where it basically works like a, a seesaw up and down. Once this goes up, then it goes back down the opposite way. And we saw it here. So as T3 and T4 increases in the body, this is now in the blood. And so this will go back up to this area and negatively turn that off and negatively turn that off. Okay, so as T3 and T4 hormones from the thyroid gland increase in the blood, it negatively comes back and turns these two off. If you turn these two off, then the secretion to this goes down, therefore this goes down. So that's negative feedback. The other one, the positive feedback is less common, but a good example is down here in the uterus or the cervix. If this is in the process of childbirth, the head of the baby is pushing on the cervix, which has stretch receptors. So this would be neural, this would be a neural stimulus. These stretch receptors transmit nerve up to the hypothalamus and release a, a hormone via the posterior pituitary, which we saw as oxytocin. Oxytocin goes into the blood, goes all the way down to the uterus, and we saw that causes calcium, therefore muscle contraction, and it pushes the uterus harder, which then means it pushes the head of the baby harder, and it just reinforces, reinforces. This is positive. Keeps amplifying, 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 all the way to the point where the head is now out, the baby's out and the stimulus is turned off. There's no more stimulus, then all this turns off. And that is an example of the positive feedback mechanism. So there we have it. They're the principles of the endocrine physiology and hopefully now you can tick all these off and you now understand them. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.